So anyway, as you see in the title, uh, this is the Thanksgiving you thought you knew. Okay, got it. Yes, here we go. And uh, all right, let's 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 get started then. So these are, we're talking about origins, customs, holiday symbols, and I found some really neat stuff. I think you'll really like it. Hey, well, you might ask, what does it mean? And a lot of people, the big thing is turkey, and we'll get to a lot of turkey later, and holiday shopping. That's all, we'll get to that too. Now, it's come into question among historians about whether the pilgrims had the first Thanksgiving. And actually, uh, according to history.com, I read an article about it. They only one pilgrim, Edward Winslow, recorded this. It, it supposedly lasted three days and, and hosted 150 people. He did say that there were fowl served. He didn't say whether they were turkeys or not. And possibly other things on the menu were lobster, seal, uh, much of it prepared by Native American methods. One of the things that we would think would be there would be actually cakes and pies, but we're pretty sure they didn't have that because by the time they got to New England, the the ship stores on the Mayflower of flour and sugar were pretty much over with. They had all been consumed and uh, they had no oven either <laughs> yet. <laughs> so that's another thing we have to consider. So let's move on, but uh, hey, now here's one of the things you may not have considered it, but uh, a, a credible claim is made that uh, St. Augustine, when they landed there on September 8th, 1565, they feasted with Native Americans. And that is the earliest date for some sort of Thanksgiving in this country. And also in Texas, near present day El Paso, uh, Don Juan de Onante and settlers, they reached the banks. They also had Thanksgiving. And uh, so. Thank you. And also <laughs> in Berkeley Plantation uh, in Virginia. And they also had a Thanksgiving celebration when they landed. and. This is what they said. We ordain that the day of our ship's arrival at the place assigned for plantation in the land of Virginia shall be yearly and perpetually kept holy as a day of thanksgiving to Almighty God. So the idea was already there. And we're perhaps wondering why is there such a New England cast to this? Because as you see, <laughs> the, the pilgrims were really among the last people to actually get here. So how did they get this hold on Thanksgiving in American life? And this is basically my personal opinion based on things I've read that the Puritans and pilgrims believed implicitly that the Bible was the prime cornerstone of religious belief. And of course, you had to know how to read it. And they literally produced and sent forth thousands of school teachers with the growing United States. And they literally set the agenda for much of education in America. And in my opinion, that's why New England is so closely associated with it. And also another thing is, is that they practice it more often. A lot of these other things like Florida were sort of occasional affairs and they made it a real habit. And uh, it was kept on and off throughout our colonial period. Finally, in 1789, George Washington appointed a general day of Thanksgiving. And he was the first president, as well as the first president general, but he was also the first president to set it as the fourth Thursday of November. And that's pretty much how it was done, but not always. Now, um, 
this is a sort of interesting piece. Uh, in the Civil War, uh, President Lincoln was prevailed upon by uh, a, a woman named Sarah Josepha Hale. She was the editor of Godey's Ladies Book, and she urged them to have a day of our annual Thanksgiving made a national fixed union festival. And here is the lady herself. I call her the godmother of modern Thanksgiving. Uh, she, her magazine was so popular with women that she had 150,000 circulation, which was pretty good number for mid 19th century. And so she was in a perfect place to persuade the president to do this. And uh, while she was at it, she also uh, helped raise money for uh, Vassar Women's College and even found time to make sure that they uh, raised funds for the Bunker Hill Monument, which you can see if you ever go to Boston. And uh, she was uh, really something. She was also the editor of uh, Godey's book for 40 years. So she was a force to be reckoned with. And the holiday gradually spread. And this is actually an interesting picture because there, in the Civil War period, there was this group of private individuals called the U.S. Sanitary Commission, and what their aim was was to raise money for medical supplies, personnel, field hospitals to help the Army Medical Corps treat Union soldiers who were injured or sickened in battle, and they had these big, massive fairs to raise money, and this was the hit of the New York, City of New York's and the City of Brooklyn's Sanitary Commission Fair. It was called the New England Kitchen and uh, volunteers dressed in colonial garb would serve New England style things like a boiled dinner and stuff like that. And uh, it, 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 was, it, it was a real wow. In fact, it's credited as being New York City's first themed restaurant. So there. <laughs> and I found this, uh, uh, it was an army field uh, Thanksgiving. And up here you see they have pies, cider, and the sutler, these were people who actually provided provisions for the army. And they went from camp to camp with their wagons, their supplies and uh, they provided all this stuff. But uh, there was an interesting thing here. And this has been done a long time. They still do it in some way or other. They still try to have Thanksgiving for our troops. And uh, so anyway, what they did was uh, from uh, a book by Chris Ager, it was called uh, Guns, from guns.com. It's with the troops on Thanksgiving over the years. And this was a picture taken from that article. In fact, actually, there's a personal collection to it because in uh, November of 1944, my father was a quartermaster sergeant and he actually got written up in the first division's actual history, division history, because he actually provided hot turkey sandwiches to them in the Hurkin forest. So there we go. <laughs> now, this was not something that actually worked very well for all Americans. And in the Southeast, this holiday was basically pretty much ignored by most people living there. And there were some reasons. Uh, for instance, before the Civil War and Reconstruction period, Southerners actually, their big holiday was uh, Christmas. And also New Year's, but uh, they really didn't bother much. And few of them even knew very much about uh, a New England style uh, kind of dinner holiday. And uh, what happened was is that it really got to be, in a way, it was sort of Amer one of America's first culture wars especially in the post-Civil War years, 
a lot of people believed in the South, the, the, the sectional feelings were so bitter about the victorious North, they felt that New England values were being forced upon them. And it took some time to get actual acceptance of the holiday. And there were a couple of reasons why it happened. First of all, a lot of tensions and animosity eventually eased with the passage of time. And also a lot of Yankees started moving <laughs> down to the South for the better weather And Florida, of course, got a whole mess of them. And uh, so they sort of introduced the holiday to their Southern friends and it gradually got more acceptance. So especially by this period, the First World War, it, it seemed like a good time for Americans to gather together and be one people. And so basically this is where we got to. Now, this is sort of interesting because um, traditionally, the president would issue a proclamation naming Thanksgiving as the fourth Thursday of the month. But in this case, President Roosevelt didn't do that. And he actually moved it to the fifth week of November. And as you see on the headline here, said uh, Roosevelt to move Thanksgiving, retailers for it, Plymouth is not. Said football schedule makers also get a headache with season set to end with fifth Thursday in November. So why did he do it? Well, he, he was approached by major retailers like Kresge, which is now Kmart, and Sears, which of course is still around, and uh, other retailers to add uh, an extra week of shopping for the Christmas season. And uh, so he thought that it would help cash strap Americans who were mostly buying things on time. They had something then, which a few stores occasionally still do have a layaway. You put down a certain amount of money and pay so much per week. And, you know, it seemed like a really good idea. <laughs> And, but it not always, and this was a great telegram I found from this restaurant in Alliance, Ohio, from Liotta and Helen Kerr. And they said, congratulations on your reelection in 1940. When shall we serve our Thanksgiving turkey, 21st or 28th? And it was a real problem because 12 states, Florida among them, decided to hold it on the fourth Thursday. And you could have just tremendous thing like for instance uh new york uh celebrated on the fifth but if you were going to school in connecticut which is only a few hours away by train and wanted to join your family they would actually have to have two thanksgivings because you wouldn't be out of school on their day it would be the following week and of course it threw all the stuff, I mean, travel schedules for trains and airlines, radio programming schedules, football schedules. It was just insanity. Finally, <laughs> order was restored in 1941 Congress in a great burst a partisan <laughs> cooperation set the fourth Thursday date and that's the way it's gonna be from now on. <laughs> now, this is sort of interesting. One of the strange customs we have <laughs> is, does the, why does the president pardon a turkey? And it's been attributed to President Truman. However, the Truman Library actually refutes that. They said at various times, different presidents have been given turkeys by constituents and, and other groups to for Thanksgiving in the White House. And uh, it's, uh, in fact, actually there's a wonderful story that President Lincoln received a turkey and his son Tad got so attached to it that he named it Jack and he, he, he begged his father to spare him and his father dutifully wrote out a pardon. <laughs> and so uh, Jack walked around the White House grounds with Tad as a pet. 
So that's where we are there. And of course, you know, this custom is ripe for satire. And these are some cartoons from the last 10 years or so. And uh, so what our leaders are doing this Thanksgiving, they have a caricature of Obama. He says, I'm convening my economic team and urging Congress to pass a new recovery plan to meet the historic economic crisis head on. And they have President Bush saying, I pardon, I'm pardoning a turkey. And here's uh, President Trump said, my presidency and Thanksgiving are unconventional and he's ready to sacrifice uh, the media, which is the NBC Peacock, <laughs> in case you haven't, haven't noticed because he had a lot of problems various times with the media. Now, of course, I have no Biden cartoons because it hasn't happened yet. So that's why I'm using what we have. Okay, well, you know, not every turkey makes the cut for the pardon. And this is what happened in 1953, Swanson introduced the TV dinner. They had extra turkey and they packed them into 5,000 aluminum trays and loads of peas and sweet potatoes. And there we have TV Thanksgiving. <laughs> and also we have a new culinary tradition. Uh, and I was, I was uh, four years old <laughs> when I was introduced. It was actually invented by a woman named Dorcas Riley and she got into the Food Preparation Hall of Fame, believe it or not for this, but it was a way for Campbell to sell his cream of mushroom soup for the holidays. And that's why it wound up being part of the Pantheon. <laughs> and of course, here's one of the eternal questions. Stu is it stuffing or is it dressing? And normally you would think logically, if it's prepared in the bird, it's stuffing. If it's baked by its own self, it's dressing, but it's never as easy as that. And in Butterball, according to their website, they had um, a, a survey and they found that 15 states, uh, five of them in the South actually call it dressing. And that's always historically been what uh, Southerners have said, said, oh, y'all call it stuffing, but we call it dressing. And apparently there seems to be some veracity to that. <laughs> and cranberry sauce, <laughs> you know, you can love it or you can hate it, but it's still gonna be on the table and everybody does something different. I actually do fresh cranberries <laughs> and they're actually, it's as easy as dirt to do this. Uh, it's actually on the package. So if you want to do something different, just get a package of fresh, but you have to ask why is there fresh and why is there uh, uh, canned? And there is a good reason for it because traditionally cranberries were grown dry and picked like other fruits off the bushes and they still are. And those are the ones that wind up fresh, but the ones that wind up in cans, they are uh, harvested uh, uh, wet. They are actually kept in bogs of water and their natural buoyancy actually brings them to the surface and they scoop them up. And you've seen the, in old movies, those big wooden scoops and they're in wearing the waders and stuff like that. But uh, here's what happened though. They now are basically picked mechanically and happened since the 1930s but mechanical sort of bruised the fruit a little. And so they're not allowed to sell them as fresh. So the obvious solution is can it. <laughs> That's what they did. Uh, one of the eternal question, is it pumpkin, apple, or sweet potato? I, everyone has their adherence. And I know, I know, I didn't have enough room for mince pies, so please forgive me. But uh, anyway, I actually found this uh, on a, uh, uh, Better Homes and Gardens and another site called Hungry Dudes. And they maintain that apple pies are not really a true Thanksgiving 
a, a dish because the harvest season for apples are September and October. So basically they're sort of, you can't make a fresh apple pie because the apples are not fresh. So we rely on frozen and uh, or canned apple. So what they do say though, are uh, pumpkin. And uh, now pumpkin pies are sort of interesting because uh, the oldest American cookbook was produced by Emma Simmons in 1796 called American Cookery. And this is basically what our ancestors prepared their meals with. And uh, this is what she described. It was actually described as a, a pumpkin pudding made with sugar and nutmeg and baked in a crust, which basically is a pumpkin pie. <laughs> and uh, now the last one, uh, sweet potato pie was also very interesting because in Africa, uh, the natives actually ate a lot of yams. And when they were taken into slavery and brought to this country, didn't have the yams, but we did have sweet potatoes and that was a good substitute. And so literally generations of African-American cooks and families have produced this and it still is a great favorite. It's not considered Thanksgiving in many African-American households without doing that. And of course, we have to do football. And this is a 1928 ad uh, cover for the Saturday Evening Post and it shows <laughs> a pilgrim and a football player. And so this has been part of the Thanksgiving scene for quite some time. And it's, it's a big thing. People are either playing it on Thanksgiving, especially after they've eaten <laughs> and need to run around the yard for a while. As you see in this picture, here, the men are listening to a game on the radio while, you know, a feast is being set. And of course, there's a lot of cartoons about this. I thought this was a cute one, having a turkey, a day to stuff my face and watch football. I mean, what can you do better than that? Now, another one we're going through is the Macy's Parade. It's not Thanksgiving without the parade. And uh, it originally started in 1924, so it's been around for a while. And it was sort of originally meant as the open to Christmas shopping season, be sort of more of a Christmas parade. It, but since it's held on Thanksgiving, it gradually got to be associated with the day. And... Uh, this is from the 1934 parade, and uh, that's actually uh, Balloon of Mickey Mouse. And if he looks a little different, uh, the early Mickeys had a much more rat-like appearance, which Disney over the years remedied and made him a little more sweet and fuzzy. <laughs> and this is from the 1940 parade. I know because they have the great dictator on the marquee. So I know it's 1940, this is Times Square, New York. And they have this uh, balloon of a hippo and they actually would let them loose at the end of the parade. They'd go floating in the air because they were filled with helium and they would drift wherever the winds took them. And uh, if you found one, you would, uh, the store would give you a $25 uh, gift certificate, which is over $500 today. So <laughs> you had a really good Christmas shopping season if you found it, but they had to stop it because it was a hazard to aircraft. And of course, by the 1940s, more and more planes were in the skies. Uh, in fact, actually in New York City's case, uh, they already had Newark, uh, which is now Newark Liberty, just across the river <laughs> in New Jersey. Uh, and uh, LaGuardia in Queens was uh, operating. So there were, there were a lot of planes going on around. So they stopped doing that. Now, uh, the parade has been interrupted and uh, they had uh, no parade between 1942 and 1944. 
because they didn't have the personnel and they didn't have the materials. So they literally surrendered themselves to the war effort. And what they did is that this was a dragon balloon that they filled with air and in great dramatic fashion, Mayor LaGuardia actually, you know, plunged a knife into it to deflate it. <laughs> And they did that to all of the balloons. And what they did is that it produced 650 pounds of rubber for the war effort. And uh, this is what the ad copy from Macy's said. <laughs> they said, we've enlisted. <laughs> and this is what it said. It said, we are turning ourselves over body and soul with no strings attached to the New York City Salvage Committee destined for the rubber scrap pile, we will perhaps find our way into tires for tanks or maybe life rafts wherever we're most needed. And that was supposed to be from the balloons themselves. Now, of course, after the war, everything resumed. And this is a popular New York thing. If you're ever there during that time, it's really sort of worth it to go to uh, West 79th Street by the Museum of Natural History and watch the balloons being filled. I mean, I, I've done it once or twice. It's, it's so much fun. Sometimes they even let you help. <laughs> and Macy's Parade actually wound up in the Miracle on 34th Street and they actually filmed during the 1946 parade which was not the first post-war parade. That was in 1945, but this is the 46 one. And actually Edmund Gwen did double duty. When you see him as Kris Kringle in the parade, he really was in the parade. They used him for <laughs> the Santa Claus. And uh, this is what Maureen O'Hara recorded. It was a mad scramble to get all the shots we needed and we got to do each scene only once because they were not interrupting the parade. They had to catch all of this on the fly and make it work. And now the Macy's Parade started being broadcast on the radio according to nyctours.com in 1932. And uh, by 1948, it was televised for the first time. So gradually, this is what helped make it a thing in the United States. More and more people were starting to tune in and listen to it on the radio. And then gradually, they start doing television. And this is, as you can see, NBC camera has one of the early parades, probably from the 1950s. And of course, they estimate about 40 million people tune in to actually see this parade on TV. It's really an international event now. Now, of course, these are the customs on Thanksgiving that nobody likes. And we have crowded airports, TSA inspections. Uh, some people try to beat the system by traveling earlier, like three days earlier, but apparently a whole bunch of people get the same idea at the same time. So that is not going to help you. And of course, we've had to deal with COVID. And uh, actually, to its credit, the Macy's parade did not stop. They could have suspended the parade last year. They held the parade and in order to make it all work. There were absolutely no spectators lining the sidewalks at all. It was just the parade, which was televised. <laughs> That's how they, they did it. But a lot of people, they're having smaller gatherings, vaccinated Thanksgivings, uh, and trying to make it work. Of course, we have crowded roads. According to AAA, they say 47.8 million people take to the roads on Thanksgiving. So that's quite a few people there. And of course, Black Friday, I mean, it, the deals are good, but I mean, people have literally been maimed. I mean, broken arms, fistfights, you name it. 
uh, I actually saw a video in his mad melee uh, uh, years. This this young man got pushed into an empty uh, bunch of shelving in a store and broke his hip. <laughs> but uh, but the most important thing is just to get together and give thanks and just wish each other great happiness for the holiday and the new year. And I want to thank everyone because uh, this is a great picture. I found this on a government website, National Archives. This lucky family in 1942 got all their sons in the service for Thanksgiving, which, you know, was very rare. <laughs> So I want to thank everyone. If you have any questions, please be uh, feel free to ask them and I'll try to answer them. Thanks again.